going to be particularly concentrating this morning on Luke and ch chapter 6 and verses 39 to 42. So children, you should have some sheets uh, that you'll help you to uh, follow uh, the message this morning. Do you have a spare one for me, Mark, at all? Have you got a spare one for me? All right, okay. And um, if you take them to Mark afterwards, maybe a reward. So the sheets are there to uh, help you to concentrate. Children, great to have you with us. In fact, great to have everybody with us wherever you are. Uh, we're now going to turn to God's word. Um, we're turning to Luke's gospel and chapter 6, verses 39 through to 42. We're going to think, uh, uh, think this morning about three desires of the true disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Three desires that are found in the true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are your desires this morning? What are your desires this morning? If uh, you were asked what's, your, what's top of your desires this morning, uh, what would it be? For many of us, it probably is a longing for lockdown to end. Just get over this time, then we can start to live again. That's the spirit that's around us in our community. And I fear it's a spirit that's around in the church. But one thing I want to challenge us with this morning is this is the now time for us as a church. We, we can't be just thinking about what's ahead and waiting for that in a might be, could be, possibly, but we are called to live now. And we're going to think about three desires which are found in a true disciple. Three desires which we should have now and be living with now and not just waiting for another day and another time when we can see these desires develop. With these three desires, we'll not just survive, we will prosper, we will move forward as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just to put before you the importance of these things, if you don't have the desires this morning, if they're not ticking in your heart, then then you can't claim to be a Christian because these are the desires of a true Christian. So be good for us to examine our hearts because if you're not desiring the things we're considering about this morning, then you have to really test yourself about whether you are a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're in the midst of this section where the Lord Jesus is specifically addressing his disciples and teaching them what it is to be a disciple who truly lives for his Lord. The Lord Jesus, we remember, has come into the world. He's fulfilled the Old Testament. He's the fulfiller of everything promised and prophesied in the Old Testament. And now he's come to establish a new regime. His church, his people, his group. There are the old, there are the other representatives, the old regime that are around, however. And they are led by the Pharisees and the scribes. So look at them as we will see them in uh, chapter 5 and verse 33. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and often offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. So there are these Pharisees who are the representatives of the old regime. And they've got their disciples. And if you want to follow that way, which basically is focusing on keeping rules, then you can join with them but the lord jesus is saying no 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 don't go that way don't go that way i'm establishing my new way my way that truly fulfills everything that's gone before and my way is the true way of god so follow me look at verse 5 and verse 27 
After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me, come after me. And that's what we are set to do as true, true believers in the Lord Jesus. We're called to follow him, to look to him and to go in his way, to be in his group. This new group, leaving behind the old way. So as we come, uh, uh, and the uh, passage develops here, in verses chapter 6, verses 12 to 16, we see this first group, this first group of disciples. The Lord Jesus has called them. And then in verses 17 to 19, we see things happen which basically seem to say, yes, it is right to follow Jesus. He is the central figure of everything. And then we come into uh, chapter uh, uh, 6, verse 20 onwards. And the Lord Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching how it is right to follow him and how we should be following him. So in verses uh, 20 to 26, we're shown how we do everything on account of the Son of Man. We will go through anything because the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, is our focus. And then in verses 27 to 36, we're there showed, shown how, going into verse 27, we are to love our enemies and do good to those who hate us. That is what the true Christian uh, does. And then in verses 37 to 39, we are not to be always uh, just criticizing people. We are to be people who are generous, verse 8. Give and it will be given to you. And this is the flow of, of the, the true disciple. And now we come into verses 39 to 42. And we're going to see three desires that are found in the true disciple. And the first one in verses 39 to 40 this morning is to grow spiritually to grow spiritually. The true Christian wants to make progress in the right direction for the Lord. That's a desire that we should. So let's look at firstly at verses 39 to 40. And the Lord Jesus is, is speaking to his, these disciples and saying, telling them a parable. And a parable, what's a parable? Parable is a, 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 a story a uh, something of an earthly character which is used to teach spiritual lessons so the first thing we need to realize as we're thinking about growing spiritually is it starts with us realizing that we're blind so go to the statement in verse 39 can a blind man lead a blind man will they not both fall into a pit you know, think about it practically. Somebody's blind. They don't know where they're going. A blind person. What is it, children? A blind person can't see. So if they follow another blind person, what's likely to happen? Will they fall into the pit? Well, if there's a pit around, they're very likely to fall into it because they can't see where they're going. And we see, with regard to our spiritual progress here, we are blind. That's what we've got to realize. It starts with realizing we need help. We need those who will lead us in the right way. And if you get a blind person to teach you, they won't lead you in the right way, will they? You could go anywhere. You could be in all kinds of chaos, couldn't you, in your life. You need to get the right teacher so that you will go in the right direction. Now, as we move into verse 40, the background to this is concerning somebody who wanted to train for a certain job or for a certain profession. And in those days, uh, you wouldn't sort of uh, just go along and uh, get out some books and, uh, and watch some videos and just develop your skills. What you would do is you had to get linked up with a teacher. So if you had to, if you wanted to be a potter, 
if you wanted to make things that people could use to uh, to uh, have their meals on plates and cups and stuff you wanted to be a potter uh, to make those what you would do is you would go to a man who had the skills of a potter he would be the one you would go to and you would go to him and you would learn to be a potter and he would teach you but you could you could only go as far as the, the knowledge of the potter because as I say, you couldn't go on YouTube and say, well, this man's told me a certain amount. Ah, I'll go on YouTube and watch some videos and uh, I'll improve by doing that. No, basically, he's the man who's teaching you and you go as far as your teacher. So it says in verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but every, everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So who is teaching you is very important. So think about this. You think, you know, I'm a pot, I'm a pot. I, I want to be a potter, you know. But you know, I just just want to get by. I don't want to, I don't want to do any fancy stuff. I just want to be run of the mill, uh, just get by and make a decent living. Yeah. So you're not too bothered about who your teacher is, are you? You're not too bothered. You say, well, that's okay. Somebody who just knows his business, and I'll go and spend time with him. And I'll get so far and I'm not bothered about going any further. But if you really want to be, dare I say, a master potter, really to make the good stuff, the big stuff, well, who are you going to look out for? You're going to look out for a master potter, aren't you? One who knows all the intricacies of making the best pots. And so you'll seek out the best teacher. So let's bring some of these things together as regards to our spiritual progress and what this all means. It means that we need teachers. Now let's think about that first of all. It doesn't say we need teaching. It doesn't say, you know, a, a, a disciple is not above it, his teaching, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teaching. It's a teacher. So we have to think there is something important about being connected with a teacher. That's important for us to establish here. There's also the importance of realizing that we need teaching. Christians, we need teaching. We need it. The, which church in the first church is in, in the books of Revelation chapter 2 and 3? was probably in the worst mess which one the one that didn't think they need teaching we we've laodicea we've arrived we are rich we have need of nothing you know we've succeeded and the lord wants to spew them out of his mouth so that is something we need to be aware of this morning we need teaching. Are you, are you here this morning Say, well, I've been taught so much and I've had such a special education in the things of God. Nobody can teach me anything because I've got to the right level. It always concerns me when somebody says I'm a mature Christian and I'm thinking, Oof, wow, what are you saying? You think you're mature? What is maturity? I think probably in terms of true maturity, we might say, Dare I say, we've hardly started, brothers and sisters. So is there this yearning that we want to make progress? You see, the potter, you know, a potter, one of these potters could say, well, I know everything already. I don't need a teacher. I'm okay. They won't have a teacher and they won't progress, will they? So we have to realize we need teaching. And then we got to think about having a good teacher. Huh? We have a good teacher who will teach us well so that we will reach a high level of spirituality or we will be pushed on to a high level of uh, spirituality because we want to make progress. You want to make progress? Well, why do you want to make progress? Because my Lord has done so much for me. My beautiful Savior has rescued me from my sins and he has won my life. And I just want to know him. I want to serve him. I want to be for him. And so I long for spiritual progress. And so I long 
but I would have good, a good teacher. So what does this mean then? If you're looking for a teacher, what does it mean? Well, if you go, if you just want teaching, we've never had it so good, have we? Go home, everybody. Go home. Go and listen to John MacArthur, John Piper, and the rest of them. Of them. They'll, they'll give you far more teaching. But it's a teacher that matters. And I take it what the emphasis is here is, is actually seeing the person. So go back to our illustration of the potter. You actually see how this potter conducts himself. You study him. You look at how these skills are worked out in the way that he works. And so when you're looking for a good teacher, you should be looking at, and I'm going to give you five C's here, in order of importance. And if you cross-reference to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, you will see that character is the most important qualification for an elder who has a responsibility for teaching in the church. It is character. Number one is character. Number two is conduct. So the character showing in the conduct of this person, showing in the conversation of this person, how do they speak? And then fourthly, the content. What is it that they're teaching? And finally, the competence. Now, naturally, we start with competence. Generally, we say, well, we want some really skilled, competent teacher. But I believe the Lord talks, that the Lord develops things in a different direction. Yes, we do want the right content. And yet we do want the right, uh, we do want competent people. But we want that flowing out of character, conduct, and conversation. You need to be able to interact with your teacher. And you need to see. That's a challenge to those who are elders then. They should be visible in the church. You should be able to see them. And we need to be just thoughtful about this. In our, in, it's never been, we, we've never lived in an age like this. I mean, if it was 100 years ago, it was probably reasonably straightforward, wasn't it? You went to a local church, you saw your teacher. Now you can just be online and you can never see your teacher. You can just listen to this great stuff. It was brought home to me a little bit a month or two back where there's somebody who some of you would listen to and you and a fine, fine teacher. But something I just heard raised some questions about his character. And you think these teachers who are far, far away are oh so impressive, but character matters. Character gives value to the teaching. And we should be praying for the character the conduct and the conversation of the teaching. It's been a shocking thing to the church of the living God. What has happened in these last weeks, the revelations about Ravi Zacharias. And there was a man who had all the content and the, and the competence, but his life was a wreck, wasn't it? And, and now there's so much wreckage that seems to be being caused by what is coming out as a result of a man whose character and conduct and conversation was far below the content and the competence that he set forward. But that's your specific teacher. I want to just think about generally here. You've also just got to choose your friends. I want to make this a bit more general. Your friends will influence you as regards to whether you make spiritual progress or not. Your friends will influence you because if you have friends who are not wanting to push forward for God, you won't be pushing forward for God. It's an influence thing, you see. If you've got, you got, like, if you've got those who are pushing on for God, you'll be pushing on for God. It's a principle there. So let's be thinking then. We want to make spiritual progress. It's at the heart of what is stated in verse 39 to 40. We need to know that we are blind. We cannot make progress on our own. We need help. We cry out to help. God gives teachers. God gives those to help us. And we should be desirous of making sure we're in a situation where we have somebody who is of a certain character, conduct, and conversation, has the right content and competence in bringing the word. And I say simply, as a result of saying that, pray for me. Please pray for me.
I am just one step from shipwreck as regards to character, conduct, and conversation. And uh, just pray. And pray for the next generation. This church needs teachers, elders. Pray for them raised up who would be of this realm, character, conduct, conversation, content, and competence. Well, then we move on to uh, the next desire that should be in our lives. And the desire is to help others. A desire to help others. And I read on in verses 41 and 42. And do you, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now that final statement is very important because a lot of people read this passage and they basically say, if I've got a log in my own eye, I don't have to help my brother with his speck. And he could go around with his speck still. No, you've got to sort out the log that is in your own eye. And then you can go and help your brother who's got this little speck. Now, let's, we're, going to debate, we're going to deal with a second point out of this passage. But I just, it, it's quite an amusing thing here, isn't it? it, it even to do it in the physical. You've got this, this man, this man who's got a tiny bit of, 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 of sawdust in his eye. He's got a tiny bit of sawdust in his eye. And this other man who's got this whacking great plank is coming along and he's trying to, trying to get this piece of sawdust out and he's banging around with his flat plank all over the place, causing all kinds of damage. And he just can't be done. What's he got to do? He's got to get rid of this plank and then he can do this, get this little speck out of the eye. Yeah. Now... Let's think about this speck, you see. It says at the end, you get rid of the plank out of your own eye, and then, verse 42, it says, and then you go and take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. So this is in the family of God, this is fellow Christians, and you see a brother or a sister, and there's something wrong in their life. It's not a big issue. Perhaps, uh, perhaps they've handled the situation not quite as they, you think it could have been better handled. You know, it's not a great issue. But you think, yeah, I think they could learn for the future. And so you just want to help them. A little bit of advice, a little bit of gentle uh, correction. But you, you love them so much. Your desire is for their spiritual welfare. You don't want them to be harmed or hindered because of that event, that happening, which, is, uh, which they haven't done in the proper way. But you love them so much. You care for them. You have a passion for them. We're in the same family. I love you. I care for you. I don't want you to just repeat mistakes again and again. So I want to come and deal with that speck. Uh, brothers and sisters, there's lots of things that come off this, but I hope we're happy to have somebody deal with our specks. Are we? Are we? I trust so. It's part of family life. And I'll say, yeah, we'll be open because we want to be helped to move forward. But the desire here is, I want to help you. I want to help you. Yes, we need to sort ourselves out first, but we should be wanting to help each other so that each grows spiritually. So literally, dare I say, no arm's length Christianity here. No, keep your distance from me. I will be a little separate entity in the church and don't trouble me. This is about real getting to grip with things yeah when you go to the opticians you uh one of the things that happens in the opticians is the optician generally comes very very close to you doesn't he <laughs> because he's got to deal with those eyes it's sensitive business dealing with the eyes brothers and sisters we should welcome each other being close to us in order that we might be helped open to each other now i just want to stop there because there are certain issues that arise the first thing is we thought this morning is about we got to have a spiritual longing so that we get the best teachers. And the second thing is we got to have a desire for the spiritual welfare of each other. And both there are two things that crop up in both of these incidents. And that is 
there is living life contact. There is living life contact. This is not over the internet. This is not even over the telephone. This is living life contact. Now let me seek to develop some of the challenges of this time. And I, I wanna be sensitive to everybody who's online this morning. I wanna be sensitive to your situations and we are in the midst of this coronavirus outbreak and all the restrictions there are at this present time. And therefore there are right and proper things that have to be done. Some of you are not able to come to the building at the moment and that is right and proper. And we want to love you and help you even by using the technology. But I do want to say that online church is ultimately not proper church. Online church is ultimately not proper church. We will use it for this time for the benefit of our souls and for the binding together of our church. And it's just wonderful for those joining online because that is appropriate for your situation at the moment. And nobody is pressurized to come to the building against their conscience at this present time. But please, everybody, don't think that this is what church is meant to be. I fear that is happening. I fear it's happening. And people are thinking it's easy sitting at home and doing church. And this might continue. No, we cannot settle for that. This passage teaches us that church is living, touching, interacting, speaking face to face. Please, I express that very carefully. I am not putting pressure on anybody, but I am saying as appropriate, we are looking forward to the day when we are meeting physically. Okay. The second thing I want to say in these, this context is we are where we are. And we should be thinking about how we do use technology for as much as we can at the moment, being close to each other. There is this danger of thinking we will all start to have vibrant relationships when we once again come together, all of us in the building and everything is on hold at the moment. And I say, no, no, no. A thousand times, no. Now is the time for building relationships. Now is the time for using technology for the best means possible to love each other, to care for each other, to be interested in each other. And you say to me, I don't like using the telephone. I find it awkward or I don't like using Zoom because I just don't get with it. I find it tiring. I find it whatever you might say. And I understand that. But I just plead with you to say, if your use of Zoom or the telephone is going to bless a brother and sister, won't you self-sacrifice your own difficulties and give yourself for their welfare at this time? because we care for each other. But don't be just thinking one day, please brothers and sisters, the day may never come. I, I say this carefully, we're all expecting the announcement tomorrow, that's great. Do you know, we've got these variants going around like that. A variant could come, which just goes completely the other way. And the deaths we've had so far will be nothing. That could happen. I don't want to be a pessimist or anything. But I just want us to be real. We don't know whether we, what is ahead. We have to live now where we are. So brothers and sisters, use the technology for building relationships. Don't just sort of stay in your own castle and wait for one day to emerge. Just use the technology because well, if you're a true Christian, you have a deep care for the spiritual welfare of each other. And you don't know sometimes how much you'll bless somebody for actually being even at a prayer meeting online or being at the Bible study online. So that's the 
second point, and I've gone into this issue of this togetherness and how it's reflected in the fact that we meet and we see each other. The third point then is to think about there is a desire to sort ourselves out. So we thought this morning there is a desire for spiritual progress, for number one. There is a desire for the spiritual welfare of our fellow brothers and sisters. And there is a desire to sort ourselves out. So we thought about the illustration this morning, this man with a great big plank in his own eye. And he's going around seeking to help somebody else, but he won't address this plank and he's causing all kinds of damage. And that can happen in the church because you can have people who, who just don't bother about their own sins. They just, uh, they're just thinking whether they got pride, whether they just shout their mouths off or all kinds of sin. They're just causing havoc in the church because they're poking around in all of these other little specks. And fundamentally, what's the problem? What's the problem? They got sin in their lives and they won't deal with it. <laughs> That's what it is. They got sin in their lives, they won't deal with it. And so as a result of having sin in their lives, you don't think properly, so you're unwise. You don't speak properly, you speak harshly, and you don't act properly, you just act in an unpredictable and generally harmful kind of way. And often this stuff is just like Pinocchio as well, isn't it? Anybody know the story of Pinocchio? What happens? Every time you don't deal with your sin, it goes, whoo, whoo, and the plank gets longer and longer. And by, by the boy, you know it, you've got this, it starts there and you've got this whacking great plank that you're going around with and you're, you're havoc in the church. So you must get your sins dealt with. Yeah, it's good to be interested in caring for your brothers and sisters. We thought that but we must make a priority of sorting ourselves out and then we can help each other. Your spiritual welfare is absolutely critical. Let us keep short accounts with God as the old phrase goes and let us be careful in dealing with our sins, be aware of our sins, acknowledge our sins, address our sins, that our sins might be annulled out of the way, aware of our sins, acknowledge our sins, address our sins, remove our sins. So how, what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, address the, thing, the sins that are the planks. Address the sins that are a planks. Well, perhaps you've got a big problem with pornography, and that's the plank. But you make Good attention to repenting of your lying. You repented of your lying, but your plank is still there. You haven't dealt with your pornography. And God says, deal with your pornography and get that plank. And then you'll be in a healthy state to be able to help others. You see, confession is good for the soul. That is true. But... As 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And what does the word confession mean there? What does it mean? It means tell it over. Be specific. Don't just make some general, oh, I, I'm sorry for the things I, are, that are in my life, Lord. Yeah, there's a point of that. But be, that 1 John 1 verse 9 is be, be specific. Name it. This is the sin that I've got. This is the plank that I've got. Whether it be arrogance or whether it be a rashness of speech. False accusations. If you made a false accusation, well, say it's a false accusation. Don't just make some general confession. Specifically, deal with sins and then they are removed. If you confess, if you tell the sin over for what it truly is, then you can know that those sins are cleansed away and you can be helpful to others. So we are to make a priority of our own spiritual welfare and the cleansing and removing of our planks, our sins. So stop this morning. Do you think you might have a plank? <laughs> you know, the thing is here, the man with the plank doesn't realize it. <laughs> 
he's clattering around dealing with the spec, but he doesn't realize he's got a plank. You see, that's what we're all like, isn't it? We so easily see the faults in others and we don't see the faults in ourselves. So do you know what we need? Do you know what we need? Do you know what I need? I need you to tell me my planks. I need you to tell me my planks, you know? And I need to be willing to hear you tell me about my planks. Yeah. I need to be humble enough to appreciate that you love me so much that you're actually willing to tell me you've got that wrong in your life. And I should be willing to receive it because we don't do that. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you've got no right to tell me. Oh, no, no. I'm okay. I'm a strong Christian. Nothing in my life. That happens more than we are like to think. And that is my natural reaction. But the godly reaction is, I want my spiritual welfare to be as healthy as possible. So please come to me. Please help me. I need you. And there we are. It's this part of the brotherhood, isn't it? This is brothers, you see, in verses 41 to 42. It's brothers. It's the family. We care for each other. This is not arm's length Christianity. So three spiritual desires, spiritual progress, the welfare of each other, the priority of my own spiritual health. And they go together. As we come to conclusion, there is a harmony, harmony in these things, isn't there? As I grow spiritually, as I have this desire to grow spiritually, I will be continually sorting myself out and I will be helping others. As I grow spiritually, perhaps you are useless this morning for God because you've just got no spiritual desire. Well, please this morning, sort that out and see the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ who has won you for a life, has won you for a new direction and see him. And then long to go forward for him and to be continually sorting yourself out and of help to others in the church of God now. And as I started, I just remind you and I say to you this morning time, if you don't have these desires, then you're not a child of God. Then you need to come to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and find salvation and find spiritual desire and find a desire for the people of God and your own welfare, confessing that you need help. Finally, dare I say, brothers and sisters, go for it. Get on with it now. Because you don't know what tomorrow will bring forward. Seek to grow for the Lord. Seek to love his people. Seek to get your own heart rightly and properly in order. And go on. And may we be strong together for the Lord. The Lord bless his word to you, whether you're online or in the building. And may we go forward as a transformed, renewed people into the Lord's way for his glory. We're going to sing our final hymn now.